सुस्वागतम नमस्कार एम छो आदाबार्स गुड आफ्टरनून गुड इवनिंग गुड मॉर्निंग डिपेंडिंग अपॉन विच पार्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड यू आर आप सभी का पी आर एल के अमृत व्याख्यान में स्वागत है अभिनंदन है वेरी वॉम वेलकम फ्रॉम मी अनिल भारद्वाज फॉर द पी आर एल का अमृत व्याख्यान टूडे इज द फोर्टी फोर्थ व्याख्यान ऑफ द सीरीज ऑफ सेवेंटी फाइव व्याख्यांश विच इज बींग ऑर्गेनाइज एज अ पार्ट ऑफ पी आर एल्स सेवेंटी फाइव ईयर्स ऑफ लेगेसी एंड हिस्ट्री इन फंडामेंटल फिजिक्स एंड स्पेस साइंसेस इस्टेब्लिश इन द ईयर नाइनटीन फोर्टी सेवन बाई द फादर ऑफ इंडियन स्पेस प्रोग्राम डॉक्टर विक्रम सारा भाई द पी आर एल्स प्रेटिनम जुबली ऑन साइड्स विद इंडिया सेवेंटी फाइव ईयर्स ऑफ इंडिपेंडेंस हैंस इट्स अ जॉइंट सेलिब्रेशन ऑफ द डेवलपमेंट of science and technology in india by prl under the banner of prl ka amrit vyakhyan today we have yet another very distinguished speaker professor dimitri butkar who is from helmholtz institute in johannes gottenberg university in mays in germany and he is also a professor at university of california at berkeley he is going to give a vyakhyan whose title is hunting elephants in a room if i don't go to the next part of this it is very interesting but i will read the full title it is hunting elephants in a room new ways to search for dark matter and other adventures we thank professor dimitri for accepting our invitation and to be with us in prl's pratim jubilee celebration i request my colleague Professor Bijay Sahu to kindly introduce today's vyakhyan karta to the audience on the webex panel as well as those who have joined us live on the PRL's YouTube channel. Over to you, Dr. Bijay. Thank you, Professor Bharat Bhaj. Uh, it is indeed my great pleasure to introduce Professor Dimitri Bhutka, uh, who is a you know very popular atomic physicist in uh, you know experimental science. and also you know fondly known as dima we call him you know dima you know, as fred uh, i know professor butkar since my phd time he was actually one of uh, my phd examiners professor butkar uh, as it was mentioned just now he is the section leader at uh, mainz university helmholtz institute uh, at mainz university germany and he also holds a professor position at graduate school university of california berkeley usa after receiving phd in university of california berkeley in 1993 he continued his postdoctoral research there itself till he got a faculty position in the same university in 1995 before moving to uh, us actually he was in he was uh, in ussr and he studied in novars novar uh, novasibirsk university state university from 1980 to 1985 and when he received ms uh, position in us then he left uh, ussr and then he joined uh, as a phd student in uc berkeley university of california berkeley so uh, during his phd work he has done outstanding work so that is why he got american physical society award for outstanding doctoral thesis research in atomic molecular and optical physics in 1994 and then onwards he has received several international awards and also many recognitions i'll just name a few which includes national foundation career award university of california president's research catalyst award American Physical Society Outstanding Referee, R&D 100 Award for Laser Detected Magnetic Resonance Imaging, DFG Reinhardt Kosel Principal Investigator, ERC Advanced Grant, Norman F. Ramji Prize, which I actually it is introduced recently in atomic and molecular physics community for doing fundamental science, and he was awarded that recently, and then Erwin Schrodinger. award of the helmholtz association in germany to name a few there are many more and he has been elected as a fellow of american physical society 
professor butkar's interest research interest are related to uh, study discrete symmetry violations particularly parity and time reversal violations using atomic systems and he is also interested uh, to uh, verify experimentally the temporal variation you know, variation of finish, uh, fundamental constants using atomic um, experimental methods basically using atomic clocks his other research interests are like experimental condensed matter physics nuclear magnetic resonance applications of nonlinear optics phenomena in uh, resonant vapors and uh, then uh, you know, uh, color centers in diamond to sensitive magnet magnetometry professor butkar has written five textbooks and they are widely used in atomic and molecular physics community and some of them i also use at prl and some of these books are also edited in russian and language uh, japanese language in addition to english language and among those books the book titled physics on your feet is very popular among the graduate students he has published several review articles and more than 200 scientific research articles and you know they have almost like more than 24000 citations he is also fond of playing music he is very fond of playing music uh, you know that when he visits india he tries to play new music and uh, he also wants to learn uh, indian culture that's why when he visits india he travels a lot uh, you know in, inside india and he had visited prl before i joined prl it is i think more than now uh, 10 15 years or something like that, 15 years uh, so he had given a colloquium in prl in 2015 but that was online and last year also he had given a seminar but that was again online and this time also we are having his colloquium online but hopefully next time we will have him here you know physically and with this i would like you know i hope that uh, you know everybody enjoys his talk So with this, I would, would like to request Professor you know, Butkar to uh, deliver his talk. Now the stage is yours, Professor Butkar. Thank you so much, Bijaya. This is a very, very kind introduction. And uh, indeed, you are right. I, I believe I visited PRL about 14 years ago. I was uh, hosted by uh, Professor Angon Dilip Kumar Singh, and uh, uh, yes, it was a very memorable visit at that time. So uh, today I would like to uh, talk about this topic, uh, hunting elephants in the room. I will ex explain what the elephants uh, in this context are. And um, Bijaya was very kind enough um, to mention the, the, our book, uh, Physics on Your Feet. And in fact, this picture that I put uh, right here is uh, taken from the cover of the second edition of Physics on Your Feet. So I use it also, recycle it, so to say, for, for my talk as a, as a picture of an elephant. So I uh, will try to uh, tell you uh, a, a few things that I very much hope will be interesting for you, but I will try to do in such a way as not to, uh, to, to, to throw unnecessary terminology and uh, try not to make it stressful for the next uh, uh 40 minutes or so for you but uh, but hopefully interesting so indeed uh what i mean by elephants in the room is that uh modern physics uh, uh has a lot of very serious problems and perhaps uh, uh, the, most, um, uh the most uh maybe i go too too fast that the most important one of uh, them those slides are not shared Who's yeah it? can you just share your slides Oh, I'm sorry. So I, I thought I was sharing them, and I'm sorry. Just a minute. Thank you for for telling me. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, let's see. Now you see them. Yes. Yes. Okay. In the full in the full screen, right? Right. Full screen. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm sorry. So this is this is the elephant from the cover. Yes, we are waiting uh, to see this elephant. Actually, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's uh, from the cover of the book. I'm, I'm really sorry. I thought I was sharing. Anyway, um, the, 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 maybe the main elephant and the first uh, obvious one that we have in the room is that there is very strong evidence that most of the matter um, that we have in the universe is in this strange form um, of, of dark matter. Uh, it is uh, some, some kind of um, matter that uh, uh, interacts gravitationally, but we haven't been able 
uh, to detect any non-gravitational interactions of dark matter. And this, the, the reason this problem is not a small problem, but in fact, is a very big one is because there, uh, we, we think, uh, based on astrophysical observations, that uh, there is five times more uh, dark matter than there is normal matter. So it's clearly a major problem. But uh, this is not the only uh, problem. There are other uh, problems. Uh, for example, uh, the matter that we do see in the universe is mostly that matter and not antimatter. And we, we haven't really detected any asymmetry between the properties between uh, matter and antimatter uh, so far. So uh, it is a very interesting and uh, yet completely unresolved, completely unresolved question is why why is there such a uh, large matter antimatter asymmetry? We we sometimes see some antimatter uh, that we produced in collisions and so on, and then it's also uh, uh, present uh, in some way uh, in the in the composition of uh, of, of particles. But but uh, but uh, yeah, we don't see uh, too too many. Uh, anti atoms, for example, um, in the universe, and this needs to be explained. Uh, there are some other uh, questions. Uh, so, I already mentioned that, is, that there is five times more, uh, uh, more um, dark matter than there is normal uh, matter. But uh, the question is why, why is it only five times? So, why is it roughly, you know, comparable amounts of uh, normal and dark matter? That in, needs to be explained. Maybe it's a coincidence, but most likely it's not. Um, uh, the other issues in, in, in modern physics are like this. Um, so, uh, there, is, there are these discrete uh, uh, symmetries uh, of, uh, of nature, like uh, spatial inversion symmetry or parity, uh, time reversal invariance, um, and then combined uh, 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 charge inversion and spatial inversion or CP symmetry and then CPT. And a lot of these um, are violated, in fact, uh, by the weak interactions like parity and, uh, uh, and, and CP and, uh, uh, and charge um, uh, re reversal invariance. And uh, the question is, uh, what about the strong interactions? And in strong interactions, uh, we have a, a nice theory that describes them. It's, uh, it's called quantum chromodynamics. And as, as part of this quantum chromodynamics, it's very easy to introduce CP violation, and yet there is none. We don't see. We, we look uh, with higher and higher uh, precision at uh, uh, a possible violation. We don't find it. And this also needs to be explained. This is known as the strong CP problem. Um, then there is a, an interesting problem of a hierarchy of uh, energy scales. Uh, one way to, to think about this, we have particles um, with masses all the way from zero to the heaviest particles of, of maybe hundreds uh, giga electron volts. And then there are some so-called natural uh, scales in physics. Uh, it's, uh, for example, uh, the, the Planck scale or the so-called grand unification scale. And there we are talking about 10 to the 16 to 10 to the 19 giga electron volts. And there is a huge gap of many, many orders of magnitude between these scales. And, and it's not really explained. Why is there such a big gap? Why is not everything of the same order? Um, and uh, there is also a, a problem that maybe is even bigger than dark matter. It's called the dark energy uh, pro uh, uh, problem, the problem of accelerating expansion of the universe. And uh, maybe we won't touch uh, uh, on dark energy today that much. Um, so this could be uh, a whole bunch of different animals in our room, uh, but maybe it is one and the same uh, elephant, uh, in fact. And uh, so all of these puzzles that we have, maybe maybe they're a manifestation of one and the same uh, kind of physics or one and the same elephant. And uh, this kind of um, models that solve a lot of problems uh, in one go are very attractive, uh, very, very attractive. So we'll keep this in mind as we um, discuss uh, further what the possibilities 
for what dark matter could be R. And let us just talk about this exact question. What can dark matter be? Um, I must say that uh, people realized a long time ago, uh, more than half a century ago, I guess, uh, that uh, uh, this is a big problem. And uh, people have been uh, looking uh, for um, dark matter, non-gravitational interactions of dark matter. And nowadays, one of the very popular uh, class of candidates for uh, what this could be is something that's called ultra low bosonic dark matter. Um, and the idea here uh, is uh, that um, we, we think that there is some kind of a, a particle uh, that uh, constitutes uh, dark matter. But, you know, sometimes when we have a large concentration of bosonic particles, uh, think photons, uh, for example, uh, we, we think of this this kind of a system um, as a, as a field. Uh, uh, so, for instance, a bunch of photons uh, can uh, constitute an electromagnetic wave, and it, unless we are actually specifically looking at the qu on some quantum manifestation of the light, sometimes it's much easier uh, to to think about electromagnetic field. So, uh, this bosonic um, uh, matter is just that that uh, in every galaxy there is. Uh, the, uh, you can think that every galaxy is filled with this kind of uh, field. And in fact, uh, observations show that it, it should not just be inside the galaxies. It should form maybe a, a halo, maybe a few times larger than the, the, uh, the, the visible uh, galaxy. But basically, some, some of this blob of this field um, that uh, is tied uh, to the galaxy, because there is apparently very little uh, dark matter in um uh, between galaxy in the in the intergalactic mean so it's associated with the galaxy now um quantum mechanics tells us that uh if we have these kind of uh fields um they should not generally be static um they should oscillate um just like electromagnetic wave uh you know it cannot uh, be, be static it has to uh uh you know uh, oscillate according to the Maxwell's equations. Um, so for these scalar fields, the the, uh, the the equation is called the Klein-Gordon uh, equation, and it tells us that the oscillation frequency of the field should uh, should uh, be proportional uh, to the mass um, uh, of the underlying particle, or the, sometimes it's called the Compton frequency. So you basically write m c squared, the the rest energy. Of the particle is equal to uh, h bar uh, omega, and this omega is the frequency of the oscillation of the field. And now, depending on the the spin uh, of this uh, 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 bosonic particle, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, not, also uh, uh, on on the intrinsic parity, there there, there could be a, a, a classification. So if they are scalar. Uh, particle that um, uh, have, uh, for example, positive intrinsic parity. Uh, <clears throat> that these are scalar particles, and there is a whole uh, catalog of these. One of the examples here is dilaton, um, and this hypothetical particle uh, shows up in some versions of string theory, for example. Um, and it turns out that the effect uh, of this kind of uh, field uh, is um, to mimic the variation of the fundamental uh, constants. Professor Sahu mentioned uh, earlier uh, that, uh, um, you know, people look for possible variations of fundamental constants. So, so the existence of, uh, of this field uh, would lead to oscillation, not a, a sort of monotonic change in fundamental constants, but effective oscillation at the frequency, again, equal to the quantum frequency of the underlying particle. Now, uh, if the particle is uh, pseudoscalar, uh, which means that it, it's an odd uh, intrinsic parity, uh, then uh, the, the most popular candidate is uh, a so-called axion. And the beautiful thing about the axion is that not only it could explain dark matter, but it could also address some of the other 
uh, uh, properties, uh, pro problems that I mentioned before. For instance, Axion uh, was introduced way before people realized it could be dark matter uh, to solve this, the strong CP problem that I already mentioned. Now, um, just recently, a few years ago, people realized that there could be a, a type of these uh, uh, axions, uh, relaxions. These are this is a play on on on, on words. Uh, these axions uh, undergoing relaxation oscillation, and they have actually mixed parity, and so they could both uh, show up uh, as a change of fundamental constants. And uh, I, I I guess I, I I was going to say, but didn't say yet that. These uh, pseudoscalar particles, they, uh, they interact with spins, and you, so you can detect them by doing sensitive magnetometry or nuclear magnetic resonance uh, experiments or anything that has to do with the spins uh, of particles. I'll, I'll give you some examples. Then there are spin one particles, um, uh, also called vector particles that could be so-called dark photons, for example, or hidden photons. So that's, that's one broad category uh maybe one of the most popular candidates these days is that it's some kind of a uh ultralight field now there is another uh very very interesting idea very interesting uh paradigm uh uh which is very attractive uh, uh at least to me in that it actually solves essentially all uh the problems that i mentioned uh above and this is so-called um anti-quark uh, nugget. Um, and uh, this says that uh, the idea that dark matter does not interact with normal matter is actually wrong. Uh, and that in the early universe, the uh, uh, quarks, let's say they existed um, not in the in the form of um, uh, nucleons like protons, neutrons, or pions or something, but in some um, uh, other form that's uh, called, called uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, Quark color quark condensate, I think, is the is the term, and uh, that uh, some of that primordial form uh, uh, of uh, strongly interacting matter uh, could survive until today in in the form of um, some kind of uh, objects uh, that are held together uh, by uh, by a shell made of actually this axion uh, kind of field. And uh, and then um, th these are extremely heavy uh, and, and and concentrated, um, and uh, um, so they in, it, when this thing hits the earth, it actually deposits a lot of uh, energy. Uh, it keeps going through the earth, um, uh, depositing energy due to the annihilation of the antimatter that's uh, hidden inside this nugget. That's how it solves the uh, uh, matter antimatter asymmetry uh, problem. It says that. The antimatter is actually uh, uh, hidden within these um, nuggets. And as it goes through the Earth, it, uh, annihilation releases a lot of energy. And, and the reason uh, people um, get misled uh, to think that dark matter interacts uh, uh, very weakly other than by gravitation is, is just because um, the mass to, uh, to cross section ratio is, uh, is, is very high. Um, uh, for these objects, and it turns out that it's exactly the mass to the cross section uh, uh, that um, uh, people are, 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 are looking at um, in, in astrophysics. And it, it, so, one idea is that the cross section is low, but another is that the mass is very high. And, and it turns out that this model explains a lot, a lot of different things. And some people are currently investigating experimental approaches how to, to to test this then there's all kinds of other uh stuff uh that has been proposed uh things like milli charged particles um uh there's a uh milli charged particle is that's exactly like the name says some things uh that have a charge of maybe 10 to minus 3 of elementary charge um uh, then uh, there are uh, interesting theories that do not involve any particles, but involve, in fact, global violations of uh, of symmetries uh, of of nature. Uh, this is a very new theoretical concept. Now, from the very beginning of the uh, dark matter um, problem, I should say, uh, uh, people 
said that maybe what's going on is that not that there are new forms of matter that we need to think about, but maybe we just don't understand how gravity works on distances that are much larger than the uh, solar system, for example, because our most precise knowledge about the uh, about the um, uh, forces of, of gravity comes from observation of planets, uh, etc. But uh, uh, dark matter shows up at a galactic scale and cluster of galaxies and so on, all the way uh, to the size of the universe, much larger scales. And so there, uh, there is a, a whole framework. One, uh, one of them is called Modified Newtonian Dynamic Mond. Um, and uh, there are some people who really uh, actively pursue this, but um, there are some issues um, with that. And sometimes uh, the theories of modified gravity also produce particles uh, uh, or if you apply them consistently. And then the question is, why do you need to do this if you can already introduce the particles? So, but, but people are working on this. And there are other uh, things, even, even such conventional things as black hole, dark planets, and interstellar gas uh, are still discussed. Uh, usually we hear that uh, these are completely excluded, but then somebody comes around and figures out how to uh, reintroduce them. So this discussion is ongoing in the uh, community as it should. We shouldn't be sure what it is before we actually uh, have uh, observations. Um, uh, experimental observations of dark matter, and we actually know what it is, we should keep, I think, all the options open. At least that's my personal opinion. And um, actually, dark matter people will uh, will re recognize the joke here because the last item on the list uh, that I put here is uh, the, the so-called weakly interactive massive particles. And the reason uh, it's a joke because for the last maybe 30, 40 years, and including now, uh, most dark matter searches are searching for, in, in fact, these weakly interactive massive particles. These are uh, particles with normal masses in the GV, 100 GV, say, range, something like this, but uh, particles with very weak interactions. And people are uh, uh, building amazing detectors and um, looking for them with higher, in high, and higher sensitivity, but nothing has been found as yet. Uh, by the way, uh, here I want to make a small uh, commercial break and tell you that um, uh, we will have um, interesting, I hope, uh, interesting dark matter related uh, events uh, here in Germany uh, in August. Um, they are running back to back. There are three things that are happening. The first one is a, is a school uh, at Bad Honef. Um, uh, on ultralight uh, dark matter, and I think for for PhD students uh, or uh, postdocs uh, or anybody entering the field, this is just a, a, an amazing opportunity. There are very good lectures that we have selected for this, and um, this is kind of very inexpensive, I should say, it's sponsored uh, by uh, William and Elsa uh, Herreus Foundation and. And so it's just a nominal cost uh, and it, uh, for, for a whole week of science and excellent accommodations and food and so on. But this is just one uh, event that um, is the first week of August. Then um, uh, in Mainz, we have the 17th uh, workshop on Axion, Wimps and Wisps. Uh, and uh, these are see, uh, weekly interactive massive particles and well, okay, the whole zoo. And this is happening uh, now in Mainz, the second week. Um, and uh, for those who are interested in looking for dark matter with uh, networks of quantum sensors, for instance, magnetometers or atomic clocks, there's going to be um, a workshop at the Mainz Institute of Theoretical Physics the third week. So uh, if you are interested, uh, go to the, the corresponding website, just type wavy dark matter, and you will see how to register for this. All right, uh, so now I would like to uh, uh, to maybe spend a few minutes uh, talking about um, how we uh, search for um, dark matter. And um, I, this will be a bit um, selective. I will tell you some things that I'm personally interested in. 
but before we we plunge into that, um, I wanted to introduce the uh, the uh, classification of dark uh, matter searches into direct searches. Uh, the idea being that hey, there is dark matter in the galaxy, so it's all around us. Let's uh, measure it somehow um, non gravitationally. So this is a direct search, and in direct uh, search is um, Let's say there is uh, uh, some dark matter particle that forms dark matter. I, I don't know, for example, Z prime boson or something like that. Then uh, not only it can be present uh, uh, in, in, the, in the real form around us, uh, but also uh, it, it can produce virtual particles. Um, and uh, uh, you, you, you know that this picture that the interaction between Particles uh, can be described by the exchange of vertical, virtual, sorry, virtual um, uh, particles between them, and uh, so uh, if if these particles exist in principle, they could also be virtual and can modify the interactions uh, between particles. Or or you can, uh, for instance, think about having colliders where you uh, produce some exotic particles, and some of them could be the particles that. Um, uh, actually also make dark matter. So this is the distinction. And now there are many different um, ways uh, 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 how you can search. So in some um, pretty random order, uh, I will list some things I'm going to also mention uh, next. Uh, for instance, um, you can use antimatter uh, as a detector uh, for dark matter. And this such experiment uh, has been done at CERN a couple of years ago. I'll I'll talk about it. Uh, but also, um, uh, right right now we are entering uh, a very interesting um, period in, in in science where we can make um, atoms uh, that uh, have antiparticles in them. For example, a, a helium uh, atom, where uh, instead of uh, um, Instead of one of the uh, electrons, you have an antiproton, and you can study whether uh, there are some exotic, unusual interactions in such atom. And this would be an indirect search for for dark matter. There, there are experiments measuring electric dipole moments um, uh, of particles. Uh, electric dipole moments, permanent electric dipole moments, are forbidden by uh, uh, CP uh, symmetry, and so. They can only appear when such uh, symmetries are violated, and they are closely related uh, to the dark matter problem. Uh, precision spectroscopy, NMR, astrophysics, and accelerator-based uh, uh, searches here. And all of them can be either direct or indirect searches. I must say I'm very uh, uh, pleased uh, about something that's currently ongoing uh, in the United States. There is a, a process uh, called the snow mass uh, process of the entire physics community where uh, people are looking at different parts uh, of physics and evaluating the priorities uh, and uh, looking for interesting things, identifying interesting things to do uh, in the next few years. And uh, these findings are uh, collected in the form of so-called white uh, papers that are published you can find them on the archive and there are many uh, uh, that are uh, related to uh, you see scalar and vector ultra light dark matter uh, there is wave like dark matter axion white paper space time symmetries and gravitational physics also a related topic and um, of course uh, new searches at uh, new levels of sensitivity uh, are um, always uh, requiring and are enabled uh, by uh, new sensors. And uh, these days, uh, there's a lot of attention that is paid to, to quantum sensors. And I'm, I would like to uh, advertise that uh, la uh, last year, um, Mariana Safronova, my colleague, my very energetic uh, colleague, Mariana Safronova and I, we uh, were guest editors for the quantum science uh, and technology, a special issue that has a lot of different papers about new detect uh, detector technologies and how they're going to uh, play a role in the fundamental physics discovery in the next 20 years or so. And for this um, 
And for this uh, uh, special issue, we wrote an editorial with our views on this, uh, and we called it Quantum Technologies and the Elephants, and you, now you already know the reasons why we called it like this. And I would like to share with you that I'm particularly um, proud of this uh, paper, uh, it, uh, because uh, when we submitted it to the archive, it was rejected, and it is the only time uh, in my career when a, 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 a paper was rejected from the archive, but you can find it uh, uh, in print in quantum science and technology. They didn't like the title, I suppose. So, uh, what I'd like to do now um, is uh, to give you uh, a few examples. So, maybe run through several examples very quickly. Of experiments. Um, of experiments uh, <clears throat> um, that we do um, uh, to, to look for dark matter, just to give you an idea of what kind of hardware uh, is involved and what is the diversity. So I mentioned that uh, the pseudoscalar uh, particles, uh, they interact with spins, and so there is a whole broad class of experiments uh, based on nuclear magnetic resonance, among them is uh, cosmic axion spin precession experiment or CASPER. And this, uh, uh, this is actually a whole experimental program with two headquarters. One is in Boston University um, in the United States and another one is here um, at Mainz. And the, the, the general idea uh, for, for all of these experiments is that we uh, prepare uh, ensembles of polarized uh, nuclei um, and uh, then, just like um, in the normal uh, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, experiment, we have uh, these polarized nuclei sitting in a, in, a, in a large magnetic field, and then we apply a second oscillating field um, that, that is uh, transfers to the leading field, and when the frequency of this oscillation is resonant with the Larmor precession frequency of the spins in this large leading field, then the spins begin to um, deviate from the direction of the magnetic field, and, and this um, can be picked up with uh, some kind of a pickup coil or magnetometer. So, in, in CASPER, we do uh, the same thing, except we do not apply this transverse oscillating field, but we uh, rely on the dark matter uh, field slightly interacting with the spins to do it for us. And uh, all we need to do is to scan the leading field and, and look for resonances that uh, would be induced in the spin precession by, uh, by this background dark matter field. And this experiment uh, has, pub has, oh, sorry, has recently published uh, first results and uh, it's a, they are the first steps um, in uh, the CASPER program. So another uh, uh, system where you can look for um, for this kind of uh, dark matter that interacts with the spins uh, is magnetometers or spin masers or spin amplifiers. And uh, recently there is uh, um, a series of experiments, beautiful experiments. I will tell you about one of them uh, that were done uh, by my colleagues at the University of Science and Technology in Hefei in China. Um, uh, looking for dark matter either uh, directly as shown uh, in this uh, picture, so the, here you have uh, this uh, spin um, amplifier, uh, which combines, in, it's a vapor cell experiment, which uh, where you use um, rubidium atoms that are very easily polarized optically that uh, then transfer their polarization to nuclear spins, uh, in this case, uh, are the spins of xenon um, atoms, and uh, then the xenon atoms uh, precess in, in the presence of the <clears throat> resonant dark matter field, and then this precession is read out by optical means with rubidium again. Um, now, uh, so the, the, these are direct <clears throat> searches where we look for uh, dark, uh, dark matter existing here, but you can also look for exotic interactions, and here is uh, one example. So you basically have a very similar uh, apparatus that you tune to some resonant frequency, and then you take some very heavy mass, uh, you put it outside of the magnetic shield. I forgot to mention that these, uh, these apparatus are uh, carefully shielded from real magnetic fields 
uh, with multi-layer shielding. And the idea being that dark matter cannot be shielded by, uh, uh, by magnetic shielding. And so it penetrates nicely and, uh, into this enclosure and, and attracts with our spin. So here we also, we put, um, instead of the dark matter field um, that is present there, we, uh, we have a heavy mass. And then we rotate it around at a frequency that's resonant with the uh, sensitive frequency of this um, amplifier. And um, we are looking for this unusual force that's called Phipps force that is not a magnetic field. And in this case, it's a so-called monopole where mass is the monopole and the spins are the dipole, monopole-dipole uh, interaction. And this is directly um, puts uh, uh, constraints or, or looks for first, and then if we don't find anything, put constraints on the interactions uh, of the exotic particles. Now, uh, there is this uh, uh, very uh, nice way to search for dark matter. There's then some of the uh, uh, theories uh, of, of, of these ultralight bosonic dark matter. It, it is not uniform and it can have some uh, topological structures in it. And these structures could be either balls of dark matter uh, or um, uh, maybe strings of dark matter or, or walls um, of dark matter, or so-called axion uh, or axion-like particle domain walls. And um, uh, what we uh, have set up uh, is, a, is a network of optical magnetometers all around uh, the planet, unfortunately, we do not have a station in India, but we do have uh, stations in many other uh, places. And we will hopefully have one uh, in India. We are negotiating with some colleagues of mine to add a station in India as well. Um, and so when this structure is, uh, is going through, um, uh, then um, uh, we expect uh, from uh, our understanding of how uh, dark matter should behave, that this, the velocity of this uh, object with respect to the Earth should be on the order of 10 to minus 3 of the speed of light. And so it will take maybe half a minute for it to cross uh, the Earth, and it will uh, interact sequentially with all of these stations and uh, will provide a particular pattern of the signal. And we analyze the signals um, from all of these different stations and, and look for such objects. and. We also published a major result um, uh, uh, recently about this. This is called the Global uh, Network of Optical Magnetometers for Exotic Physics Searches. Um, okay, so uh, then let me just briefly mention uh, a completely different search. Uh, so, as I already mentioned, in many uh, pictures for dark matter, it's only interacting with uh, uh, matter very weakly, um, okay, except for this axion quark nugget model and other models, it's only very weak interaction. And and so if you have some dark uh, matter uh, chunk here, uh, suggestively drawn like this, um, uh, it could be moving inside the Earth without interacting with uh, with the material um, of the Earth. And if it somehow formed there. Um, it could be sloshing around or having some orbit uh, inside the, uh, the, the Earth. Um, and then if this uh, happens, then we, in principle, we can uh, detect this with a network uh, of um, gravimeters on the surface of the planet. And it, as it turns out, geologists have set up a beautiful uh, network of uh, this exquis exquisitely sensitive um, superconducting gravimeters. And, and um, uh, there are a few dozen of them, and they have operated for 40 years, and the data are available for you to look at. And so this uh, PhD student of mine, Nathaniel Figueroa Lee, um, and others, um, other colleagues, have analyzed um, the data looking for characteristic frequencies for oscillations of such matter. Again, unfortunately, we didn't find anything, but we are, um, when we don't find uh, uh, dark matter, we uh, still think it's a very useful thing because we, we kind of limit the the parameter space for what it might be. And so it's, uh, in a sense, um, also uh, quite useful. 
So um, um, I mentioned that scalar dark matter can uh, can uh, uh, cause uh, fast oscillation of fundamental constants, and the fundamental constants are oscillating. And if you think of uh, energy levels in an atom, in a molecule or a molecule, these levels can be oscillating at this frequency and could be whatever you you know um, could be very small frequency, could be large frequency. The the, the theory doesn't really constrain it. And um, uh, our theory friends really like uh, kind of megahertz, hundred megahertz, uh, something like that uh, frequency. And and so this apparatus is uh, basically uh, it looks a, a, a bit complicated, but it's it, uh, this is uh, so, uh, so called Doppler free um, saturation spectroscopy. And uh, in any undergraduate. Uh, modern undergraduate lab on uh, laser spectroscopy, you have a apparatus of this uh, complexity, and uh, this allows you, surprisingly, uh, I guess, to reach uh, the sensitivity of uh, fractional uh, variation of the energy levels uh, pushing 10 to minus 18 at the moment, and so you can really have a very good uh, handle on um, uh, on on this fast oscillation of fundamental constants. Um, so, uh, this I already mentioned to you, this is really a, a fantastic, really amazing experiment uh, that is done by the base collaboration at CERN. And CERN is the is currently the, the, the world center for, for the laboratory study of antimatter because they produce antiprotons and, uh, and then they can um, decelerate, uh, capture and store them for many months. And uh, they do experiments in, in high, highly precise um, antiproton traps, and they work usually either with one or with a, with a couple uh, of antiprotons, and they exquisitely precisely measure everything about it, magnetic moment, uh, masses, and so on and so forth. And at some point, they uh, can even compete with uh, similar measurements for protons, even though it's uh, anti antimatter here. And so several years ago, we collaborated with um, uh, with the base uh, group um, and uh, reanalyzed their data for, to look for uh, uh, spin interactions of the dark matter uh, through the scalar uh, field uh, with antiprotons. And if you think that uh, the interactions of dark matter with antimatter are the same as the interaction of dark matter with normal matter, this is not a super sensitive experiment, but there are reasonable theoretical schemes where dark matter could um, interact with antimatter quite differently. And uh, in this respect, this is a very interesting probe, uh, that probe uh, completely unexplored um, sort of range of physics. And uh, uh, finally, in this little uh, <laughs> selection of various interesting things that are happening. I would like to mention uh, an ongoing uh, effort to use uh, levitated magnets. These are macroscopic magnets. There may be uh, 10 to 100 micron size magnets that are uh, levitated. And uh, we have shown that these objects uh, can be used as uh, very, very sensitive so uh, uh, sensors for exotic interactions. And, pro and hopefully in, in the next few years, they will contribute to these searches as well. So uh, now let me see how am I doing uh, on time. Um, uh, do I still have a few minutes? Yeah, I think you can take yeah ten minutes. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Maybe uh, how many? How many do you give me? <laughs> I can. Uh, yeah, please. another ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yes. Perfect. 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 Thank you. I'll, I'll, that's exactly what I want. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I want to. I already mentioned these possible fifth force uh, uh, interactions uh, of uh, exotic particles, and and um, uh, this idea uh, was uh, put forward by Moody and Wilczek uh, in this paper, and they gave some examples of these exotic interactions. And uh, that was not a, a complete catalog. It was expanded greatly by the Bresco uh, and Moshao uh, later on. But it turned out that this is really not 
a, a full catalog either, and the most complete catalog of these exotic interactions uh, has been published just uh, a, a few years ago. This is Pavel Fadeev, uh, PhD student uh, at Mainz, and, and uh, Philip Fitchik, he's um, a, a student at uh, Krakow, and uh, there were a few senior people involved in this work, including Victor Flambaum uh, here. And um, uh, so uh, the, these papers provide uh, uh, the different possible uh, ways uh, these exotic interactions can happen, and uh, uh, they come um, in the form of the in interaction potentials. And this is one of them. This is um, a velocity-dependent spin-spin um, interaction. So in this case, it's a spin of the neutron interacts with, with a spin uh, of electron, and this is just a derivative of the Yukawa uh, potential, where the the mass of the exotic particle determines the interaction range lambda uh, here. And this is one of the possible ways this exotic interaction uh, can occur. And if you look at uh, at the uh, symmetry properties, uh, you, you immediately see that uh, this is a, a parity violating uh, thing because you have two, two spin two times. Uh, so that, that is uh, P even and uh, R, uh, the vector between the two particles is a is a normal vector. So when you do spatial inversion, you have a sign change. So this is a parity violating, but uh, time reversal invariant um, interaction. And in principle, uh, this can arise if you have, in addition to the usual uh, Z boson, um, this is which is a gauge boson of the weak interaction. If you have a lighter uh, partner, uh, Z prime, and then um, uh, it can uh, lead to such interactions. And so uh, the way the experiment at Hefe uh, works is there is a, uh, a, a spin source. Um, these are polarized rubidium atoms. Uh, and then there is a spin sensor. It's again uh, a, a spin amplifier, um, which uh, uh, uses xenon atoms. And if you polarize uh, the spins, uh, the exotic interaction creates uh, a pseudo magnetic field, uh, uh, basically the, the factor with a similar to a magnetic field uh, directed in this direction, and then uh, the spins will be processing. And this experiment um, looks for it in a sensitive way. So it's uh, this is the shielded apparatus. There is a spin source, spin detector, and this is the resonant characteristics of the of the spin amplifier, and uh, 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 these are the results. This is just published on the archive uh, uh, just now. Um, and um, uh, so, so you can see uh, that this is the, the, the possible electron-neutron uh, coupling that leads to this interaction. And that this experiment uh, uh, covers, uh, it didn't find, sorry, <laughs> exotic interactions. But uh, it, it it excludes a, a, a broad range uh, of uh, parameters, and, and and this experiment here is uh, also uh, an experiment from our group done several years ago. This is parity violation in ytterbium uh, atoms, and and this is a beautiful experiment by Larry Hunter, Professor Larry Hunter at Amherst College in the U.S., where he uses uh, the Earth, the polarized electrons of the Earth, um, as a source. And, and then makes um, some 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 good searches uh, at a much larger um, uh, distances uh, comparable to the size of the Earth. All right. Uh, uh, so um, I don't really have time uh, to tell you about uh, other things, but I just maybe name briefly the the things I don't have time to talk about. Maybe you'll ask me. Uh, in the question and answer session, there is a, a very interesting uh, proposal um, called Gamma Factory at CERN. And in this proposal, uh, we, uh, which is actually a reality, we, instead of uh, having bare heavy uh, ions, uh, we can accelerate, um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, hydrogenic uh, ions with one electron left or, or helium like ions or lithium like ions uh, to relativistic, highly relativistic energies. And then if we shine a laser photon uh, 
heads on with the incoming relativistic ion, um, the ion can get excited, and then when it excites, um, all the light goes in the forward direction due to the magic of relativistic uh, transformations, and its energy is boosted by a huge uh, uh, factor, uh, and, and so we can have uh, a, an enormous flux of photons of, of very high energy. And it turns out that this enormous 27 kilometer uh, accelerator, circumference accelerator, uh, can become a, a simultaneously a precision, highly precise ion trap and a unique uh, light source. And we can do tabletop kind of physics and look for dark matter. Uh, directly and indirectly with this very exciting project. Um, this I'll probably skip, uh, just maybe say that uh, we, um, I, I wanted to show you some very fresh thing. This also just uh, uh, published on the archive, and this is uh, based on the idea of Steven Weinberg um, of the Weinberg Salam model uh, shown here um, to. Uh, test for a possible extension of quantum mechanics uh, uh, that he uh, has devised, where if you have three atomic clocks connecting uh, three levels like this, uh, then uh, in this particular extension, uh, it is possible that the, if you um, add the frequencies measured by clocks one and two, you will not get exactly the frequency of the clock three. And uh, so we found some specific experimental systems, not only where one can do it, but also there are some systems where these tests have been done uh, without reference to Weinberg's uh, ideas. Um, uh, so it's a, a kind of an interesting uh, uh, thing. And uh, the very, very last thing I want to, to mention is that we are uh, doing a lot of these different uh, experiments to look for dark matter. And you might say uh, this is completely you know, pure science and has no applications, but, but I, sometimes there are applications. And uh, I just wanted to mention also this, this appeared um, in the journal yesterday. So that's why I um, wanted to show it to you. Uh, so motivated by um, uh, the technology we use to uh, analyze the networks of uh, sensors, in this case, magnetometers for dark matter searches, we decided to to turn our attention to some other objects like cities, and we have done uh, several studies uh, of um, uh, magnetic fields uh, uh, in in the cities, including a comparative study of uh, the magnetic field signature in New York and Brooklyn uh, and in Berkeley, and um, we found uh, that uh, basically every city uh, has a very unique. Um, uh, uh, magnetic signature. For example, uh, at Berkeley, uh, it gets very quiet at night, uh, magnetically quiet at night, and, and New York never sleeps, we found out. But yeah. Right. So uh, the time is out uh, in this talk. I, I very much hope uh, I, inter I was able to entertain you a little bit uh, about recalling the elephants in the room. And um, raising the possibility that maybe, maybe actually there's maybe only one elephant, and we are just seeing different manifestation of the same elephant. There are many ways, uh, very different ones, very different ones, to 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 look uh, for such um, uh, elephants. And specifically, as just one example that I spoke in at, at least some amount of detail was the recent parity violating spin-spin uh, interaction search um, at uh, University of Science and Technology in in China, uh, and then also mentioned the, the the recent idea about Weinberg one one two three experiment and the application uh, to uh, the uh, application to uh, studying the cities, magnetic field signature of the cities. And uh, to end, I just wanted to, we were talk, we've been talking about elephants in the room and the related things, and I just wanted to show you a picture that I took in my room at my home yesterday, uh, and here it is. So thank you so much uh, for your attention, uh, uh, and I'm really happy to answer any questions you have.
Thank you, Professor Butkar, uh, for such a, an entertaining and lucid talk covering and touching various experiments uh, looking for dark matter, telling us about novel ideas. Some of them really look small scale or what we call tabletop. So hopefully these new technological advances and such ideas will give uh, more uh, uh, more speed or more push towards some of these experiments, which can be done at not just very big labs, but at smaller places so that we have multiple experiments. I think that's also another idea that the community is looking for, that it's not only concentrated at places like CERN or Slack, but could be multiple experiments could be done and falsified. Absolutely. So fantastic, Absolutely. fantastic talk. Uh, and now we are open for questions. So <clears throat> you could raise your hand uh, in the WebEx panel and th those of our colleagues who have joined via the YouTube could type your questions in the YouTube chat box and we'll systematically try to take them one by one. So the floor is open for questions. Okay, so I don't see any hands raised, but I see. I was, uh, I saw, I saw that was, ah, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vijay, Vijay has. Yeah, yeah. Now it has appeared. There was some. No, delay. Actually, uh, Nobindra had raised first, so let Ravindra. Okay, okay, okay. Ravindra okay fine, fine. Now. Because for yeah, some, yeah. sorry, for some reason yes. it did not appear for a while. So, Navinder, please go ahead. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, so my question is related to this uh, NMR uh, way of uh, detecting these uh, dark matter particles. So, uh, so, so, so when you apply the magnetic field, then you polarize these spins, and then uh, you have this excitation coil and the pickup coil. Now, uh, so the sample is a crystal. So, uh, so for example, in ordinary NMR spectroscopy, so uh, so there is a night shift. So the internal magnetic fields of the material, so they uh, they renormalize or change the uh, the magnetic field, which is actually seen by the particle, and. Uh, so that night shift uh, uh, is has to be taken into account if we want to verify the magnetic movement. Now my question is uh, whether uh, these uh, dark matter particles, the way uh, the so whether these dark matter particles uh, uh, interact in the similar way, uh, the night shift calculations which we do uh, are those calculations uh, can be applied to the dark matter particles or we, one has to take uh, into account the interaction of these dark matter with the ordinary matter. Different. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, question. Uh, first of all, I want to say that it's true uh, that in some of these experiments we use crystals. Um, in uh, in Boston, we use ferroelectric uh, crystal material, but um, at Mainz we actually use liquid xenon, and uh, at USTC we currently use gaseous xenon. So sometimes it's gas, sometimes liquid, and sometimes uh, it is a crystal. So uh, we absolutely need to know uh, the, the fields uh, seen by our atoms, but um, in some sense, um, the, the, the effects that you are talking about, they would affect the, um, the, the magnetic bias. So, so it's like they, they affect the, 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 the B-naught field in the NMR uh, uh, lingo. But um, the effect of the of the uh, dark matter is is B, is like it acts like as B one and it's resonant. So the, so it might shift. Yes, it might shift the resonance a little bit. But uh, let let us first find the resonance and then we um, uh, we will figure out the frequency. So, to so say. Uh, uh, yeah. So the, so the thing is that uh, the 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 resonance shift the resonance shift that uh, we observe in ordinary condensed matter experiments. Will it be the similar in this dark matter? Because the way the dark matter interacts with ordinary matter is different from, let's say, electronic spins interacting with the conduction electrons. See, dark matter. Um, well, first of all, we try to work with samples that don't have any conduction uh, 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 electrons. Okay, they're dielectric. Uh, um, okay. And and uh, and uh, and second. Um, um, I don't, I don't, I don't, th that, I don't think we need to take into account these fine effects when we are talking about dark matter uh, in interactions, uh, because uh, uh, this is going to be a correction to a tiny effect, basically. Um, 
But we do need, I agree with you uh, that, of course, we need to understand in, in detail the NMR of the sample that we are uh, studying. And that, in fact, where, you know, the, the, the honest work goes into understanding the, the details of the line shape, the line with the relaxations, this and that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Vijay? Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, for this wonderful talk. I have actually three questions. Uh, out of that, two are little technical, and uh, the you know, third one is the you know, more general. The first one is uh, like you know, you mentioned about so many different kind of problems and you know, different kind of tabletop experiments. So, which one you think is uh, like is most promising to test BSM physics? Uh, that means we can uh, at least see you know very fast using that uh, pro, you know, by studying that problem. Second question is uh, like in that uh, PV uh, and spin spin interaction, parity violating you know, interaction that you mentioned. So, the interaction you are considering between uh, electron and neutron, why not uh, between electron and a proton? Or uh, they, they, that doesn't make uh, you know, much difference. So, these yeah. are two technical questions. And third yeah, question yeah, is hold on, like, hold on, Bijaya, hold on, let me answer, answer these. I'll, I'll, otherwise, I'll, 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 uh, I'll forget them. So uh, the reason we mostly look at uh, electron and neutrons is because uh, of the specific uh, atom, uh, xenon, it has a valence neutron. That's why we, we, we looked at that. But in principle, we can look at other things as well. And uh, in other experiments, we, we limit uh, uh, electron-proton interactions and then proton-neutron interactions and every combination. Um, yeah, so um, that one. Uh, the first question of yours was uh, which experiments are um, most promising. So that's an interesting question, be, uh, and uh, I have my own philosophy. So, so that you will, depending on which uh, uh, theorist you talk to, they they would give you opposite opinions. So there are some people who uh, think that all this BSM is not motivated. So, so you need to look, uh, you know, for something, some other like uh, Q, there are some people who are really all about this this exotic QCD effects, and they think that everything can be explained uh, with with QCD without BSM because it's not. You talk to BSM people; they they are very enthusiastic about uh, uh, you know various uh, 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 beyond the standard model things, and and and, and so there is a, a broad variety of the ideas, and and the reason for this is that we do not have observations, non gravitational observations. So at this point, uh, my personal opinion is that is diversity is extremely diversity of experiments and approaches is extremely important. Luckily, uh, there is no lack of ideas, and so in the past few years we have seen that you can actually, with the example of the scalar dark matter, you can do something very quickly in, in the lab and and immediately uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, cut into a large. A uh, chunk of the unexplored uh, parameter space. Sometimes it's even better, like uh, this example with the uh, search for uh, dark matters that are trapped, uh, gravitationally trapped inside the Earth, and they're sloshing around. Then you you don't even need to do the experiment. You you only need to to mine the data. And actually, I've been uh, uh, calling for for this for many years, and we even have. A little pamphlet together, my colleague Andrei Derivianko published in Physics Today, where we call for everybody who is measuring anything with any kind of precision to please put a timestamp on it. GPS is very cheap, the timestamp and archive. And who knows, <laughs> maybe your next PRL will be from the data that you can take from your, you know, tape uh, or uh, thumb drive or whatever. So everything should be, because there are many ways to do this. And uh, indeed, uh, I fully agree that there are many ways to do things in, in small labs, so it could be very democratic uh, in a sense that, you know, poor university, even high school uh, can do some things uh, which could be, uh, could be useful, but yet uh, you can do wonderful things with accelerators and the things you can never do with other things. Um, and uh, I think it's only the combination, uh, like a har harmonious combination of all of these approaches, is which eventually lead us uh, lead, uh, to solving these these problems. And I mean, in some sense, it's very exciting. We have such big problems that <laughs> we got to be able to solve them in the next years. I, I I'm very optimistic about that part. Yeah, thank you. It's very convincing uh, reply, actually. 
uh, so my the third the third non technical question was like uh, uh, typically how much money is required to set up such experiment in a new place <clears throat> sometime we wonder about this you know in india because you know that we don't have such a, you know such an experiment uh, right now and uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, you are also looking for uh, you know placing some atomic clock uh, in experiment in india Monkey uh, so, that may be close. Yeah, monkey yeah. was the, the 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 main thing. Yeah. Yeah. So typical, how much like money or effort will be required to start from the scratch? Um, so uh, if we talk specifically about our GNOME network, okay. So I would estimate uh, maybe maybe 30 uh, 30000 us dollars uh, uh, gets you in business already uh, plus so of course dedication uh, of time by by somebody a phd student or a postdoc or something like this uh, and uh, we even um, worked together with a with a company uh, called twinly and uh, twin if you go to the twinly website you can see that they sell a non you know, no equipment, uh, so that, that's very easy in some sense. Uh, it could be one stop shopping if you like. Um, and, and then there is uh, basically a very, very broad range because there are other collaborations um, uh, that, that even use uh, cell phones and go in the direction of uh, because a cell phone is actually a multi-sensor it has all kinds of things in it magnetometers accelerometers whatnot and uh then we decided that, that, that these things are not sensitive enough for what we do but uh, other people uh take advantage of the fact that okay they, these sensors are not super sensitive in, in, in the individual level but you you can have billions of them okay uh, if you if you really uh, get people excited about doing kind of science and, and uh, so there's a credo uh, uh, collaboration for example uh, based in, in Poland that does this kind of thing uh, so the range I would say uh, of course uh, could be from uh, from essentially zero okay all the way to um, as I mentioned, uh, reorienting uh, LHC, the whole CERN complex, into doing this kind of thing with their large accelerators. So, infinite range, in a sense. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anupam, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Hi, sir. So, I have a question uh, in your slide number nine. So, you said that uh, you use shielding and the the, in the shielded region, only dark matter can exist and in, it can interact with a spin, okay? But eventually, both the neutrinos and uh, neutrino and dark matter can be present, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, what happens? Suppose, uh, let's say, neutrino interact with the dark matter by exchanging some W bosons, then the charge lepton can interact with spin instead of, instead of dark matter, right? So, then how will you measure then? So we uh, we are not so sensitive uh, to so particle-like events, right? Uh, so, for instance, if some kind of a cosmic ray comes and hits our detector, it will be some kind of a noise spike. We um, it generally contributes to the noise, but it would not mimic. Uh, we look for some specific signatures uh, of things, and uh, we don't bother with that very much. I think Anupam, there was a question okay? from somebody about whether uh, this ultra light dark matter could be fermionic. Am Fermion. I making it? I think it's flashed uh, on the screen. Yes, I was going to take it up. There's one more question. You can you can answer that first, and we can uh, take from this week. Ah, so uh, this is actually uh, when I uh, started working in dark matter uh, several years ago, and uh, I started learning about this. This uh, really. Uh, uh, was really amazing, blew my mind basically, that um, uh, you can uh, say something about the spin uh, of dark matter, uh, starting with some very, very basic assumptions. So, uh, what I'm talking about is that if you say that uh, uh, this under, uh, underlying dark matter particle is something that's lighter than, say, uh, 10 or 1 electron volt, lighter than, than that, then it has to be a boson. 
So it has to have an integer spin. And you, you, you might say, well, how can you say what the spin is <laughs> of this thing? And, and it turns out that the answer is contained already uh, in, in something I said. I said that dark uh, matter is uh, located, is concentrated in galaxies, okay? And um, uh, it, because uh, uh, of, of this, uh, it, it cannot be moving faster than the escape velocity from the galaxy. And the escape velocity from the galaxy has an order of magnitude of uh, 10 to minus 3 of the speed of light. Uh, and first of all, the first conclusion you you make is that uh, dark matter is non-relativistic because it moves with 10 to minus 3 of the speed of light and not close to the speed of light. And second, um, imagine that it's a fermion and you start putting a lot, a lot, a lot of fermions. We know how much dark matter uh, there is in the galaxy. It's about 0.3 GeV, 0.3.4 GeV per cubic centimeter. It's a... Uh, something like one proton mass equivalent in three cubic centimeters. It's, very, it's quite dilute, but uh, the galaxy is big, so it's most of the mass uh, in the galaxy. And so if you if you uh, now take this density and divide by the mass of the particle, you get how many particles uh, you have. And, and so you find immediately that uh, you have a lot of them. Uh, and uh, if you remember, uh, fermions don't like to be in the same place and in the same quantum state. So the way they solve the, the problem if you stick them in, the, in some uh, volume is that they um, start moving around, uh, moving fast. And there is this so-called Fermi velocity. And if you, it's a first year graduate school uh, calculation that you do, for example, to calculate the, uh, you know, uh, Fermi velocity of electrons in the metal, for example, is exactly the same calculation. And you find that, um, you find that uh, uh, the Fermi velocity uh, becomes equal to the escape velocity from the galaxy for the mass of the particle being 10 electron volt. So the short, uh, the short answer is that if you have a, a particles lighter than 10 electron volts and they are fermion, they will fly away from the galaxy. So they cannot be fermions and therefore they are bosons. That's how we know about the spin. Okay, Ritwik. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Budkar, for the nice talk. Uh, I actually wanted to revisit one of your slides, uh, if possible, that slide on, you know, where the emission is preferential in the direction of propagation of the relativistic particle. Yes, the gamma factory, yes. Yeah, so I was wondering if you could please uh, explain this a little bit, uh, like, uh, you know, just go through it once more. I couldn't fully follow this. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so, so what you have is you have um, a hydrogen uh, like uh, atoms, so typically it is maybe uh, the the nucleus of le of a lead atom and only one electron left, for example. Then um, in this atom, uh, the excitation uh, energy is like hundred kilo electron volt or something, and uh, so uh, if you just have uh, normal laser, the energy of the photon is maybe a few electron volts. So so it wouldn't be on resonance. But if this particle is moving um, with relativistic, very close to the speed of light with some kind of a relativistic factor gamma, and it has an oncoming uh, photon, it sees this photon and the energy shifted uh, by uh, two gamma. Two gamma. Right, uh, right. The relativistic factor, and and so this photon, this visible photon, let's say, uh, can become resonant and excite uh, this atom. And this atom, now let's see what happens in the in the uh, frame of the ion. It, it it just basically gets excited, and then it goes back, falls back to the ground state. And when it falls back to the ground state, it emits the the, the photon in its own frame in some arbitrary direction. But, uh, but now we have to look at the problem from the laboratory frame. And re we remember that this ion is moving, uh, still moving uh, in that direction. 
And then if you if you just um, uh, look at uh, the trans relativistic transformation, like Lorentz transformation, you you find uh, that uh, almost any angle of emission translates into a forward uh, direction, and the, this cone of emission is one divided by relativistic vector one over gamma, and moreover the energy of this uh, secondary photon is further boosted again by a factor of two gamma, and we, and now the the overall energy here is uh, four gamma squared times the initial energy. So if you start with say 10 electron volt and the gamma at, at the LHC could be 3000. You are talking about, you know, 3, 000, uh, 4 times 3000 square, and this is where we get this 400 MeV uh, of forward directed photons. That's the, that's the basic idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So there's um, one question. In, there's one question. Sorry, in the... I wanted to mention uh, there is. Um, there's a couple of, of papers on gamma factories, several papers um, that you can easily find by Googling. Um, and one on uh, atomic physics at the gamma factory, and, and uh, recently also on the uh, nuclear physics at the gamma factory. And there is a special issue of uh, a journal called Analander Physique. Uh, I was actually one of the uh, Co guest editors of this issue, and you can read all about Gamma Factory and its physics there. Thanks, Dimitri. There's a question by Hariom Watts why the magnetic fields in the cities are different? First, uh, several years ago, we did a study uh, in the Berkeley area, uh, and we found that um, there is actually a dominant source of magnetic uh, fields in Berkeley. This is a so-called Bay, Bay Area Rapid Transit System, or BART. And, uh, and the reason you see that the magnetic noise goes down dramatically at night is because BART shuts down um, at some point. And somehow uh, in New York, uh, there are many competing sources, and uh, none of them there is maybe a bit of depression uh, here, but uh, but there is not 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 such a dramatic difference between uh, Berkeley and that's very quite prosaic. That that basically the main noisy thing is um, uh, is uh, is a particular train system and it just shut down uh, at at night here. But uh, the, the, you can uh, dig very deep. Um, uh, into this and, and find all kinds of uh, interesting uh, things that you can study. Um, and one of them is, um, you know, how do you look for small signals in the presence of the of this basically big perturbation from the from the BART system and the modern data analysis techniques allow you to do this quite efficiently. You can have a look at the, in this paper. Thanks, Dimitri. There's another question by Ketan Patil. Uh, the Z prime mass in the milli electron volt range and couplings which are 10 to power minus greater than 10 to power minus 20. Uh, this has been disfavored by test of violation of equivalence principle. So uh, what complementary information do atomic physics experiments provide? Uh, yeah. This is uh, this is a very good, uh, good question. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, about how much um, uh, how much the equivalence principle experiments that are uh, re indeed uh, one of the most important uh, inputs um, how much they they limit things and, and now you have to look uh, in in some detail and um, which has a uh, have a work um, don't remember if it's published or submitted with uh, the group of Gilad uh, Perez it's definitely on the archive. Uh, for sure, uh, where we analyzed our um, work on uh, on fast variations of fundamental uh, uh, constants, and 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 there we give an example uh, of how um, th th there is a there are some somewhat fine-tuned situations where um, the equivalence principle 
um, experiments uh, can be made not to be sensitive, uh, and our experiments are sensitive. And that generally shows complementarity uh, between these. But, uh, but you are absolutely right that for each coupling, we should carefully look uh, and, and, and give uh, sort of a general picture uh, of uh, where these, the, this type of coupling can be constrained. It's a very, it's a, it's a very sharp question. Thank you. Tanmay? Yeah. Hello? Yes, please uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, thank you, Gutka, for a very nice talk. So, I would like to know, uh, the, so basically the concept is that um, if you have some polarized material like helium and uh, the dark matter uh, wave is basically hitting the material and it basically changes the spin and you can detect the changing of the spin in the magnetometer, right? Yeah. So, uh, so my question is that uh, 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 what is the typical sensitivity of measuring that uh, fluctuations in the spin? This is the first question. And the second question is that since you were doing uh, uh, this in the lab, uh, so basically you can probe a very uh, small distance or range is very small. So of the order of like 10 to the power minus 3, 4 meters, right? So what is the way to uh, improvise or uh, give stronger bounds uh, from this kind of uh, spin dependent couplings? So, uh, so again, we need to distinguish uh, whether it's direct um, or indirect uh, detection. So if it's direct detection, uh, it's dark matter present uh, everywhere and uh, there is no issue about the range, right? Because this field is everywhere in the galaxy. Um, if we're talking about some kind of uh, uh, indirect, then the range is important. And uh, uh, here, indeed, we have a few centimeters uh, range. And so we are sensitive from starting, let's say, from millimeters. You know, uh, there's this uh, loss of sensitivity and and then all the way to, 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 to uh, infinite. Uh, uh, di uh, distances, but I want to mention something that I didn't talk about, but I fact had on my very first slide. There's an interesting recent platform that people are pursuing, and this is shown here. And um, uh, this is uh, single color centers in uh, nitrogen vacancy color centers in diamond. And there's another group uh, at uh, the same University of Science and Technology that has been um, using to the diamond to um, search for these exotic couplings, um, uh, basically on the nanoscale, and uh, and they are sensitive to much smaller but, distances. Uh, still, than, yeah, but you still need some polarized source, right, to detect the or to measure the spin-dependent couplings. It depends uh, on what coupling you're looking for. If you're looking for dipole-dipole, um, uh, spin-spin coupling, yes, you need polarized uh, source. And uh, um, and then, uh, yeah. And um, if you're looking, for example, for monopole-dipole, then you don't need, uh, the source could be some mass that you move around. And uh, um, nitrogen vacancy centers themselves are easily polarized. Optically. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I don't see any other hands raised right now on the WebEx panel, uh, and there are no questions in the WebEx chat. Uh, are there any questions from the YouTube chat, Bhushit or Vinny? So I think it is taken off. They are taken off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, yeah. There is none. There's none uh, beyond this. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dimitri, for answering all the questions, taking the time out. And over to you, Vijay. Uh, no, we have Navinder. Ah, no, no. Okay. So, right. Navinder. Yeah, so, uh, thanks, Namit and Vijay. So, uh, it's my pleasant duty uh, to conclude this session and say thanks to all involved in a period of Amrit Vyakhyan series. So first and foremost, uh, on behalf of Amrit Vyakhyan committee, I would like to thank uh, today's speaker, 
Professor Dimitri Bodkar for taking time uh, from his busy schedule and uh, delivering uh, this excellent uh, Vyakhyan uh, for patiently addressing audience questions. Uh, uh, next, I would like to thank uh, Professor Nandita Srivastava uh, for spearheading this series and with her constant efforts. Uh, thanks uh, to Professor Anil Bhardwaj for ins inspiration and guidance. Uh, uh, to Professor uh, Palam Raju and to all the team members of the Amrit Vyakhyan Committee uh, for their efforts to keep the series going well, pre-planning and coordinating with the speakers, etc. Uh, special thanks to Vijaya Sahu and Namita Mahajan for their help in today's Vyakhyan. Uh, so with this, uh, we come to the very end of uh, today's session. Uh, now we will be signing off uh, from this platform. I hope to see you all in the next Wednesday. Yet another interesting session. Thank you very much and good evening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Dimitri. Bye.